Welcome to session 9A on disaggregated memory. I'm your session chair, Scott Beamer. And our first speaker is Scott Hare. He's a software engineer at Google, received his bachelor's degree from the University of Waterloo in electrical engineering. His research interests are in data center service performance at the intersection of hardware and software. Please take it away. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Today, I'll be introducing TMTS, Google's memory tearing system. Oh. Good. All right, just starting with a quick outline of the talk. We'll talk about why we're interested in memory tiering, moving on to what is TMTS and how it's implemented. Then we'll go on to key results and the policy insights we had along the way. And finally, our relation to other work. First, why are we interested in memory tiering? You can just look at the agenda for the session to see that hyperscalers are interested um, in reducing memory spend. Uh, and it's often becoming more than 50% of compute infrastructure, infrastructure cost. Memory tiering relies on the observation that some memory and data center applications is colder than others. Uh, cold meaning infrequently, infrequently accessed. And we take that opportunity to store that cold memory on a cheaper but slower tier and achieve similar performance. You can see in the chart below that Google has between 30 and 40% of cold memory in its clusters. But there's lots of challenges when we try to deploy this at scale, and that'll be a lot of the subject of this talk. So what is TMTS? TMTS seeks to replace 25% of DRAM with a slower Optane tier. However, the architecture is generic and isn't tied to either the 25% ratio or Optane as a hardware target. And we look to hit less than 5% average performance impact. We need to meet the SLOs of thousands of different applications and production services. TMTS is an end-to-end -end transparent memory tiering architecture. First of all, it provides byte addressable access to the second tier without page faults. It does page migration asynchronously and transparently to applications. And it's an end-to-end -end management system with, with policy implemented at the kernel, at the user space node agent, and at the cluster scheduler. Finally, we've deployed it at scale for two years. There's a few key requirements that we designed TMTS around. One is that we need to deploy it in production at global scale. This means transparent access to both the first and the second tier so that we don't have to modify the applications to take advantage of the slower tier. We have a diverse set of workloads with all different SLOs and metrics. And so we need robust and adaptable policies to satisfy all those applications. We also have some very latency sensitive applications. And so we need to provide low latency access to all the memory. And for that reason, we provide non-faulting direct access to the second tier. Finally, we need to be hardware independent as the memory technology landscape evolves. We can't be tied to one particular hardware setup. We evaluated TMTS for two years across 2,000 machines and six clusters at Google, serving over 100,000 different workloads. Our memory tiers were 25% Intel Optane and 75% uh, DRAM. And we deployed the same total amount of memory that we would on an ordinary machine. We evaluated using an AB setup comparing, comparing one tier and two tier machines in production. And then we evaluated according to whether we could maintain the same performance and utilization on two tier systems compared to tier one tier systems. And we also look at tier two access ratio. That's the fraction of memory accesses that go to the second tier. And we look at that as a proxy for performance because applications will slow down in proportion to how often they're accessing the slower memory. Uh, now we'll look at key results. So the first key result is that there was basically no impact utilization. The chart on the right shows two tier versus one tier machines and they pretty much overlap. To do this, we had to make sure we allocated at least 25% of our memory into tier two. And this covered over 75% of the cold memory at Google. And this is a robust result. We need to make sure it holds across all our different cluster environments and all our workloads. Next, we had a 5% uh, target performance impact and achieved a median 2.3 performance slowdown for our applications. 
In the chart on the right, each dot represents one the performance of one application, with the blue dots representing Hill's jobs, that's high importance, latency sensitive, and non-Hill's everything else. You can see that most of the dots fall within the zero to 5% performance impact range, and the red dots and the blue dots have about the same impact. However, we still have some applications that have significant, even greater than 10%. In fact, you can see on the left. All right, now we'll look into some of the policies and the insights we had along the way. First of all, on the demotion side, that's migrating from tier one into tier two. We found that making the demotion policy, being aware of the application class was really critical. We demote based on cold age. So a page that's sitting in tier one needs to be untouched for a certain length of time before it's demoted into tier two. We have a trade-off to make where we want to demote as aggressively as we can in order to drive utilization at the second tier, but we also need to meet SLOs. And so we can't demote too aggressively. We found that Hill's tasks, so these are the latency sensitive tasks that are most critical to our services, had a higher population of cold memory. And so if we applied the same demotion policy to both Hills and non-Hills tasks, we would be demoting more Hills memory than we would non-Hills, which inverts the priority of these, of these applications. In order to bring the access ratio, you can see on the chart on the right, uh, for Hills tasks in line with non-Hills tasks, we had to apply different demotion ages to both groups. Next on the promotion side, that's tier two into tier one. We found that hardware support was really crucial in order to quickly detect pages that were stuck in the second tier and being accessed frequently by applications. We started by implementing just page access scans, so just periodically looking at which pages are being accessed and promoting those. Uh, but this was too slow and didn't allow us to meet our SLOs. By adding PMU address sampling, we could uh, drastically reduce the time to promotion. You can see this in the top left chart where the green dotted line has PMU sampling and the x-axis is how long it takes to promote. So the distribution is pulled far to the left. And then you can also see the performance improvement with the accesses to tier two being reduced in the bottom chart. Next, we found that involving the cluster scheduler was also really important to address those outlier tasks that had really high impacts. So given that we had one tier and two tier machines in the same clusters and a diverse set of workloads, so some were friendly and some unfriendly to two tier systems, we implemented hints to steer to jobs that were unfriendly away from two-tier systems and jobs that were friendly to two-tier to two-tier systems. This had a couple of benefits. One is that those jobs that had the really high performance impacts could be steered away from two-tier systems. And we also selected workloads that have high cold memory to drive better util utilization of the second tier. Next, we had to tackle the trade-off between cold memory identification and huge pages. So huge pages uh, at Google, they're two meg in size, are likely to be warm, meaning they have some hot and some cold regions as shown on the left in the, in the diagram. This limits the amount of identifiable cold memory and how much memory we can address with tiering. And this is a particularly important trade-off at Google because Google's optimized for really high huge page coverage for its performance benefits. And so that's at odds with good cold page identification. We did find though that by adding just small code changes to applications, we could really improve the cold page identification. For instance, for Spanner, which is one of our large databases, we were able to give cold hints to two allocation sites in the code. And these regions would be backed then by only 4K pages so we could identify all the cold memory. But because these sites would allocate memory that would turn out to be cold, we didn't have any performance impact. We we're able to increase the cold memory ID from 10% up to 42% on Spanner. We hope to extend this work uh, to be done in a more automated way. This one was done by hand. And in that way, we can address more applications and uh, reduce the need to, to manually change the code. Finally, we look at a couple of applications from the broad array of applications that we supported. These are two that were at the extremes of how friendly they were to tier two. One was the Spanner database. This is a long lived database server that has a large cold in memory cache. This makes it especially friendly to tiering because it has all this cold memory that's not accessed very often. And so we can put that into tier two and you can see the results with the orange lines on the right 
on the top chart, we see a low and stable access ratio to tier two. And consequently, on the bottom chart, we have a near 100% performance ratio. On the other hand, we have a machine learning training workload based on TensorFlow. And it's a phased workload, so it'll allocate a lot of memory to do the training, but not get started quite yet. And then after all the memory is demoted to tier two, then the training starts up and drives a lot of bandwidth into tier two. Because of this, you can see the blue lines on the right drive a, a high and erratic amount of bandwidth to tier two, as well as having a, an erratic um, performance impact. This was especially problematic with Optane because this behavior would affect other jobs on the same machine and not only the, the one job that's being slowed down. Um, this once again highlights the need for cluster scheduler hints to be able to divert these workloads away. Finally, a relation to other work. Um, so there's a lot more coverage of the related work in our paper, but this is a few selected papers from Asplos. Um, there's uh, ZSwap from Google and TMO from Meta. Uh, looked at swap-based tiering at warehouse scale. And this work adds byte addressable tier two memory and builds on the ZSwap work from the 2019 paper. Thermostat, Nimble, and Aqua in this session also uh, look at memory tiering via NUMA page migration. And our contribution adds to this, bringing insights and new policies from a large multi-tenant warehouse scale production environment. And finally, Pond looks at pooling via CXL.mem. And we see this work is complementary because Pond is looking at addressing memory stranding uh, by a disaggregation, whereas we're looking at tiering applications memory on a node. In summary, memory cost as a share of compute infrastructure is a growing problem, and memory tiering can take a bite out of that. TMTS is an end-to-end -end transparent memory architecture that we've deployed at Google for two years with a 2.3% median impact to performance and no impact utilization. Thanks, and I'd be happy to take your questions.